We wear sunglasses at night. This was my son's first real interactions with the bright eyes, as my family had come to call them, dismissing the common vernacular of infected or unclean as the media liked to label them. We termed that name as not to create a debilitating fear in my youngest daughter, still staking her claim of safety in the farmhouse with her mother up the beaten path. The journey into the city was not that arduous, only a couple miles, and my son was used to jogging three miles with his dad every day along the wooded paths wearing our specially designed sunglasses with the bands across the back just to be safe. However, we never interacted with any of the bright eyes. In all of my son's short 11 years of life, he had yet to bump into any of them, which was a relief for my wife and I, who knew from descriptions by our most immediate neighbors, still miles apart, that they had come across a string of them who had wandered too far from the city. No one, not even us country folks, went anywhere without our tinted glasses, so there was never any fear of harm. The bright eyes always found their way to the next destination, as they never solicited too long in one place. On that sunny August day, on our hike down the path and into the city limits, it was difficult to assure our safety even with the glasses perched on our noses. I could understand his apprehension, as he had never seen one of these unfortunate men or women in person. With a name like Bright Eyes, one may expect to face flashing high beams in every general direction, but this was only a turn of phrase that my wife Cheryl and I used to drive the point home, that he or my daughter should never look directly into one of these individuals' eyes, just like they should avoid the sun, except in our morning sun-gazing rituals, but that is an entirely different subject. No eye contact was the most important thing to avoid when interacting with these individuals. My son Brian had heard offhand comments from his parents regarding these people as infected, as there is sometimes no better way to label them. Thus, when Brian caught sight of his first bright eye, a shabby evacuated man in rags tripping over a curb near the trailhead, he immediately dipped his chin and stared at his feet. It's okay, Bri, I told him, pausing with him in the overgrown parking lot. We watched the man continue across the blacktop and then into the empty street without a look our way, following some unseen scent at the end of his far-off stare. His eyes looked dark, Brian said, watching him go long. After he had resumed our previous pace, there weren't any lights at all. It isn't the eyes that will infect you, I answered as calmly as I could. I could admit to suppressing my own escalating heartbeat. I had not encountered a lot of the infected either, and I never got used to it, as predictable as they were said to be. You only become one of them if you make eye contact with them without the glasses. They won't even notice you if you have them on. And the virus has passed through the eyes then? Brian looked up at me, and I looked at my own reflection in his blinders, his feather of brown-colored bangs serving as an added veil to obstruct his vision. I made a mental note to cut his hair as soon as we returned home. It's not a virus per se, Bri, I said. I had to choose my words carefully now. It's not something unseen that will turn you into a bright eye. When they notice you, initiated by eye contact, they attack. Only if they make physical contact with you is the sickness spread. Remember when Mommy spent too much time out in the sun and her skin started peeling? Bri nodded. It's like that. They get sick from the bright eye's hot touch. They're like walking furnaces. That man didn't look very hot. Just don't take off your sunglasses, whatever you do, and we'll be fine, I added distractedly. I could see a new group of them massing in the street directly outside of the post office. It was far enough away that they hadn't caught Brian's attention, but I knew they were bright eyes for the simple fact that healthy people didn't spend time outdoors for long periods of time. Not in the city, at least. Brian stopped to inspect a fire hydrant, laughing to himself and commenting on the strange shape and color. I busied his mind with the description of its purpose, just to take mine off the marching band of infected drifting closer to us. Come on, we need to be quick, I said, taking his hand. I know you don't want to do this, but people live a fine life in the city, but with the right precautions, and they don't ever spend time outside if they don't need to. I feel bad for them, Brian said. They can't jog outside in the fresh air like us, or watch the sunrise. We've seen plenty of them in the woods, Bri, that's where they go to escape. I just mean that they don't loiter in the streets. It's not good. Here. I unclimped the cord from around my waist and handed him the open clasp. He pouted at me with crossed arms. It's important that we stay together. If we're physically attached, we can be sure not to lose each other. There's a lot of them up there, and this is for your own good. If I need to, I can pull you out of danger. It's only until you're a little older. He looked apprehensively up the street now, one hand pressing the sunglasses tight to the bridge of his nose. 
He could see them as well as I could, shimmering like a dark mirage of dragging feet and swinging arms. Come on, Bri, now. He nodded quietly and attached the other end of the leash to his own belt. He carried on up the street and I felt bad that my son couldn't take in his first day in town uninterrupted. Ten years ago, before the sickness, I would have gladly shown my children the open square with its hand-carved bear statue, and then taken him to the ice cream parlor, the playground, and the petting zoo, but only crucial businesses were left open these days, like the post office or the schools. Cheryl and I had taken it upon ourselves to homeschool our children, so there was never any reason to go into town, except to purchase the necessary eye protection from the local optometrist, one of the most important businesses to still exist in the shattered economy. That is what brought us down the hill on that particular day. We had ordered our first pair of sunglasses for my youngest, Marcy, and someone would have to pick them up. I would have done it myself, but I thought it would be a good boost of confidence for my oldest to know that he could hold his own composure in the midst of adversity and ensure himself that he could still live a normal life on the outskirts of the unmistakable chaos affecting our known world. Still, we cut through a weed-infested pocket park to avoid the slow-moving silent crawl clogging the main street. Neither of us tried to look at the brigade, but we certainly smelled them, the putrid emanations of rotting gangrenous body parts and moldy hair, dirty laundry and unwashed flesh, if it could still be called flesh. Brian stayed close to me, leaving the leash with very little slack between us. How do they eat or sleep? Brian asked with one last look over his shoulder. They stay together, so they must work together. They don't eat and they don't sleep, I explained callously. I could understand his look of undiscriminate consternation. They may stay together, but they don't communicate and they don't touch each other. They just keep moving, all day and all night, searching for nothing. Why doesn't someone just, just... Put them down? Brian nodded. It's dangerous to destroy them. I told you they're like hot furnaces. Well, they can also be like bombs. I've never seen it, but there were more than a few fires in the West caused by putting them out of their misery. No, it's better to let them rot and decompose in the street. They do disintegrate quickly once their life force is exhausted, and they become nothing but a pile of ash. How long does it take for them to... It depends. Brian stopped suddenly in front of the library's large windows, glancing in at the people milling inside, and he looked at me with a wanting face, recognizable behind his protective glasses. Can we go in? I checked my watch. I don't know, Brian. You'll only want to borrow something, which means we'll only have to come back. That's fine. I'm not scared anymore. I smiled at him, hoping to God that he wasn't lying, but knowing that his confidence was misplaced. We're a little early, so if you can be quick... Brian had already bounded inside, pulling me with him. I allowed the door to close conclusively behind me, knowing that the bright eyes didn't use doors but could find their way in through an open door if left unattended. I had heard plenty of horror stories from the locals. As expected, all of the patrons inside the library wore the same dark glasses, and all their heads snapped to the exit to regard the newcomers with a few nods or blank faces, all before returning to their dull, suspended, collective hush. I allowed Brian to lead the way through the maze of shelves, and I kept my eyes on the large windows, cursing the owners for leaving them unshaded like that, as there were too many panoramic views of the main street just outside. I monitored a number of bright eyes closely, as there were a few wandering too close to our business. A few tilted their filthy, bearded faces in the direction of the library, most likely caught off guard by their own reflections in the glass, which caused them to gravitate ever closer. I didn't think they could see through the windows at us, but I couldn't be sure. It was too bright out there for them. At least that's what I reassured myself with. Now, in the graphic novel section, Brian sat down Indian-style to flip through a few colorful pages, and I allowed him to be a kid for a while as I measured myself in front of the infected man floating past the closest window. The tattered shoulder of his jean jacket bumped against the window, which was only loud enough for me to flinch. He disappeared past that frame, appearing in the next window and this time tripping over himself. A bluish hand reached out instinctively and steadied his dead weight against the side of the building before he was gliding off again into the next window frame. And then Brian was back on his feet, tugging me down the next aisle with his new prize. If you found something, let's take off, Bri, I said to him quietly. Can I check the mystery section, though? I'll be quick. He didn't even wait for a response before he was pulling me along again, and I resisted playing a new game of tug-of-war with him. Mystery section's the other way, I insisted, but he stubbornly opposed, so much so that I lost my balance, like the bright eye outside, and fumbled for stronger footing against a nearby stuffed chair. Catching myself there, I upset Brian's own balance, and the leash pulled him into me so that we collided. The glasses, admittedly too large for his face, came off and skittered across the carpet. 
and his own sneakered foot crushed with them, separating them into equal halves, minus the lenses. I caught him before he could go sprawling into the wall, but I could not prevent him from looking up into the nearest window right into the eyes of a bright eye, and Brian screamed. I didn't even have to look over my shoulder to know what he'd seen. The rest of the library's patrons were looking at us now, and a few quick thinkers had already booked it for the exit, stupidly leaving the door to swing open and jam there. I looked behind me, burying Brian's face in my chest, just in time to see the bright eye react to Brian's gaze, instinctively sensing it as I had heard rumor. And now he was slapping aggressively with the glass with his broken hands, bearing gray, rotting teeth, and looking through the glass with his blue, milky cow eyes. I whipped off my own glasses to strap across the back of Brian's head, and as other people screamed and threw curses in our general direction, I scooped up Brian's broken glasses and crammed them blindly into my pockets. This time Brian did not resist my force as I carried him away from the breaking window and joined the swarm of people scrambling for the exit. But a significant traffic jam had formed there, and a few bright eyes had caught whiff of the commotion and were forming a barrier just outside. I made the mistake of looking directly in front of me at the exit over the heads of the desperate patrons and caught eye of a skeletal woman with gray tufts of hair and a hanging jaw. At least, that's all I would have seen with my sunglasses. Without them, she glowed brightly like one of those expertly cut geometrical bulbs lighthouses use. Blue flames licked off her body as if she was the matchstick, and now I could see that her eyes were indeed blinding white and searching, finding me instantly. I thought that the bright eyes could only inflict harm on those without glasses, but I was wrong on this front. The woman and a few more walking corpses had reached out and grabbed a man and his elderly father, reeling them into their collective fires. They screamed as their forearms visibly smoldered and smoked under the direct contact. I steered left away from the entrance and toward the nearest window. As I heard the glass directly behind us shatter, followed by another pane, I set Brian down briefly and allowed him to keep his face in my shirt as I picked up the first computer monitor I could find to hurl through the untouched pane. It shattered and crumbled into bits of dancing diamonds at our feet as I lifted Brian up into the grass outside and proceeded to climb up after him. He knew enough to grip the leash with both hands, pulling with all his adolescent strength as an extra added weight to guide me into the sunlight. I allowed the bits of glass to disappear into my palms and knees as I joined him outside. Brian screamed again when he saw a new bright eye shambling toward us on a pair of boots coming apart at the heels and slowing him considerably. I only caught sight of his grotesque stick legs, shriveled to their bones like a mummy but still glowing that blue phosphorescence before I had Brian in my arms again and I was running as fast as I could back through the pocket park, across the weedy blacktop and toward the trailhead, the welcome sign bobbing in front of me but not seeming to get any closer. But the streets were in commotion now. All of the bright eyes had reacted at the same time, following some hive mind reaction to attack anyone and everyone wearing dark glasses. Others were running toward the woods like us, and someone had even freed their concealed carry revolver from their belt. We heard the loud reports somewhere in front of us, and the trailhead sign and trailhead were engulfed in flames. More women and men screamed from every direction, and I chose a new course, away from the usual beaten path and down into an area I knew to be overgrown with marsh. It was known to be riddled with sinkholes and decades of fallen, rotten trees that could give in to the lightest of steps. But I plowed through the brush, calculating every footfall with even distributions of weight and followed the sound of running water, where I knew we would break out of the overgrowth and find our sanctuary at the bank of the Charleston River. It was roaring that day, too fast for an eleven-year-old to cross safely, but we had the leash and I put him down in the tall grass to bend down to his eye line. Okay, Bri, remember what we taught you. You kick like a dog, right? He nodded gravely. I'm going to let you wade in front of me a bit, but I'll be right behind you with the cord. If I see you being carried away, I'll be quick to pull you in. It's just like all those times we went fishing, right? And we reeled in those big guys? I won't let you be taken too far downstream. Now you've got this. And he did have this. He was a stronger swimmer than I had anticipated in such a critical moment, and he led the way, thrashing and kicking against the current. He was being swept quickly away, but so was I. We were keeping our heads above the water, though, and I felt the cord pull tight with the resistance stacked up between us in the form of so many pounds of living water. The river wasn't wide, just a few dozen yards across, and it was mostly shallow, at least enough for me to dig my heels into a stack of rocks below me. 
This didn't do much good for us that day, unfortunately, as a pack of wolves had followed us into the clearing, and I had enough wherewithal in that adrenaline-spiked moment to take my eyes off my son and look back over my shoulder at one of the infected wolves, venturing out ahead of the pack to dip his fiery, smoldering paws into the water. Steam licked off its flank as it waded in after me, its dead eyes set on me, and its blue auric flame gliding across the rough surface of the water like a kerosene flame consuming its pool of oil. Brian had almost reached the other bank now, now hundreds of yards downstream from where we had started, but almost safe. I was not, however, as my foot caused one of these stacks of stones to become unsettled and clamped down around my ankle. I could not move, and the leash had grown even tighter, uncomfortably so, and causing Brian to flounder, struggling against the stream. And I watched his head go under for a moment, as I struggled to free my foot, to wriggle out of my boot, to do anything but drag my own sorry self and my son under the water. I could smell the roadkill stench of the creature's breath, now close enough to warm the back of my neck, like walking into a pocket of sun on a cloudy day. I looked back to see that more of the wolves had joined their friend, tufts of dead fur coming away from their flanks as they paddled, revealing the black but somehow incandescent flesh underneath. They moved as open flames across the water, and the leader of the pack was within arm's length now, panting from its exertion and already snapping at the open air. Brian, keep going! I screamed to him, and he looked back for the first time at me and the approaching pack at my back. I stopped swimming to grapple with the clasp attached to my belt. I almost had it free, but Brian screamed, No! Louder enough for the wolf to shut his trap and drift for a moment with his companions. Brian swam harder, with so much force that there wasn't enough give to undo the clasp, and I was actually being yanked forward, the stone shifting and my foot almost wriggling free of my boot. Brian, you have to go on without me! I attempted to shout, but somehow he'd made it to the shallowest part of the bank, and he was digging in his own feet now, turning around and setting all his weight against his makeshift harness like the tail end of a tug-of-war competition. The upper half of his body was out of the water now, and he was yanking, wrenching me out of the water and out of danger like the fish that I was, and I gladly left my boot where it was. And then I paddled harder than I ever had before, allowing Brian to fall back in a spray of water with the sudden slack to the line. He was almost snatched by the current again, floating like a cork on his back, but I was in that shallow area now, pulling him away from the moving lights in the water, only snouts protruding from the surface with a single dancing candle flame. We both crawled out of the river and across jagged gravel and slippery slicks of mud. We hacked the water out of our lungs and hung off each other's person to regain our feet. And then we were laughing, limping away from the banks without even bothering to look back. It didn't matter anyway, and I'm just glad Brian couldn't see the skeletal hellhounds through his dark glasses. Five full-grown wolves on the hunt were scary enough for an 11-year-old, let alone an adult male. Now I know why you make me jog every morning, Brian heaved as we struggled toward the screen of trees to our right. I had already lost my other shoes somewhere in the mud pit below us, and I quickly followed Brian's example as he undid the leash from his belt. I allowed it to collect on the ground for the wolves. I'll race you home, he yelled to me over his shoulder, already punching through the thicket into the safety on the other side. I didn't have to ask him if he knew where he was going or ask him to be careful, only to wait for his dad.